Today's episode of the Stallside Podcast was brought to you by Rudin Riddle Veterinary Pharmacy. But how goes it today? Fabulous day. How about you? Uh, living the dream, living the dream. Um, yeah, a bit of a change of tack today. Interesting yep. guest on the show. F- fun episode today. I'm looking forward to it. Um, you know, in spite of being in the horse capital, in the thoroughbred capital of yeah. the world, we have a recipient herd, which our thoroughbreds don't use. But we have today Crystal Howard, who manages the Root and Riddle recipient mare herd, in to talk to us. Yeah, and so everybody thinks about, you know, I have this mare, they want to flush an embryo, I have this frozen embryo, I want to implant. But I think few people have an insight into exactly how much work goes into creating a herd of excellent recipients and having a uterus available at the right state, at the right time to put that embryo into. Yeah, these guys put a lot of work into it, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that Crystal will bring light to some of that. Yeah, absolutely, yep. It's quite a um, it's quite a ballet of health management and mare selection and timing. Yep. So on Stallside this week, we talked to Crystal Howard about the Rudin Riddle recipient herd for the Reproductive Centre. <laughs> Crystal, welcome to Stallside. Hello. Yeah, thanks for taking time out of your very busy day to be with us. Very appreciated. Always exciting. And it is a busy day, but starting off, tell us a little bit about yourself. What got you here? So I am originally from Kansas and um, thought I wanted to go to vet school and got an internship out here in Kentucky doing the Kentucky Equine Management Internship and spent six months out here in central Kentucky working with thoroughbreds and thought, oh my goodness, look at all of the options that are out here for jobs. Mm -hmm. So uh, I went back home, graduated college, came back, and my goal was to manage a broodmare farm. And I thought, oh man, what do I got to do to get there? And uh, I got a job working at the clinic on nights. Mm -hmm. I was part of the nursing staff and spent a year on nights and a job came open in repro. And I thought, oh, man, this is it. This is it. This is how I can find out how to get where I want to get. And I thought, oh, I'll just spend six months or so there. And uh, that was in January of 2008 when I went to Repro. And I've been here since. There so the whole getting to be a broodmare manager didn't work out the way I thought it would. <laughs> but I'm still here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you have had an, um, sort of a bit of an interesting uh, um, sort of uh, pathway to get to where you are. But yeah, I remember you being like night tech. I mean, you know, we've been here that long. and But you've stayed with the practice and, you, and you, you've grown. And you mentioned about managing the thoroughbred farm. But actually, you have a very important role um, at Root and Riddle. And that's actually management of the recipient herd. Yes. And that is actually a big job. So talk to us a little bit about um, the facility that's been built and what does it actually take to create a herd of excellent recipients? Because these mares do not grow on trees. No, it's not easy. N- not it's that not, I'm aware of, at least. Yeah, it's not easy. So, yeah, just so talk a little bit about the facility out there and talk about what goes into making an excellent recipient. So um, our recipient herd is located about five miles up north of the clinic and we've got 210 acres and we have a band of about 450 mares total only half of those are on property at any given time um the other half are out having babies or being you know raising their children of their own and um we work very hard to grow our herd with specific criteria we're looking for young reproductively healthy mares, um, ideally at least 15 hands, if not a little bit taller. We want them to have a good temperament. Um, you know, you want to be able to handle them. You don't want to have a mare that foals that then you can't catch or, you know, be able to m- mess with their baby any. And um, we want them to be healthy. I mean, it's it's all the way around, um, you know, temperament, age, height. Uh, we want them to be able to be uh, to thrive in a herd of mares because these mares are run in a group of 30 to 40 per field. So they run in large groups and that's just for um, efficiency. To be honest, it's more like a, and able to get them done in the amount of time that we need to do them. And we have to have them in larger groups. And um, so, so how do you make that assessment? Because that's got to be done really yeah. fairly quickly or does, do some of them get cold out after you, you bring them into the herd? We evaluate them like the minute they get off the trailer. We want to look at them. Um, we want to make sure we know their age. We look at their body condition. Um, we look at their, um, you know, their eyes, teeth, the whole works. And then we do a very sp- strict biosecurity protocol 
So the first thing that happens to these mares when they come with us is we do scope their guttural pouches, looking for chondroids, um, mucus, or anything in there that may make us suspect that they might have strangles. Um, we send off a test for uh, f- to screen for strangles. Once that comes back negative, those mares get turned into a spot um, with maybe other mares that are of like status, other mares that have had an initial PCR that has been negative. And then we monitor those mares for 21 days at a minimum. So every day we're looking at the, that the mares and checking temperatures. We're looking at their, um, looking at their uh, condition. We're making sure there's no snotty noses, no coughing. If anyone shows any sign of illness, then we restart that quarantine and go back to the 21 days. And we'll wait until we are 21 days free of any type of signs of illness, any temperatures, anything like that, then they get re-screened again for strangles. If they are negative a second time, then they get released out into the general population. So it's a really strict biosecurity because we want to make sure that we're doing the best for our clients by not introducing anything they would not want on their own farms. Sure. Yeah. And I don't think people realize how difficult it is to actually create a good recipient. The number one thing is you have to start up with a healthy mare, right? And you mentioned things reproductively that have to be done. So what's the sort of screening that the veterinarians go through um, at the uh, recipient herd to sort of say this mare is going to be reproductively sound and she's worth putting in the herd for you to manage? We start with just the basics, so just a palpation or a rectal ultrasound of their uterus, make sure that, you know, there are two ovaries, a uterus and a cervix, um, that she's not full of any type of like fluid or um, cysts. Um, we make sure that they're not already pregnant. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, um, sometimes that where we get these mares, we may not know, or the owners may not know. We've had that happen a couple of times where it's like, oh, well, this mare would be lovely, except for the fact she's pregnant. So she'll have to go back to you and mm-hmm. fall out. Um, we, we start with those things. If it's a maiden mare, we generally don't culture them. Uh, it's kind of safe to assume if nothing's been introduced into the environment, that the environment is clean. Um, if they have fold before or if they are a returning mare from our herd that's been out, has been weaned and has returned, we will um, perform a uterine culture cytology to make sure that those are clean before we would put another embryo in there for, for um, an additional cycle. So, so how long do they stay in the herd? So one, once they come, how many folds can they have? How many times will they go out? We will keep using them as long as they're doing the job. Um, so we have some mares in the herd that have had five or six foals with us, but a typical mare comes in. So let's say she's brand new. She comes in, she gets an embryo right now in 2024. She would go out and foal in 2025, and then she would return at the end of 25 and then be ready again for the 26 year. So it's kind of every other mm-hmm. year, but depending on when they return into the herd, sometimes they come back and they make it through their quarantine in enough time that they can get another embryo that same year. So they may go out this year, full in February, return in in June or July, and we may still have donor mares that are being flushed that she could get another embryo and go right back out again. And we like that. We love our ladies to Mm -hmm. be useful. Um, It's good for them. They they like being out, so um, we try to use them as often as possible. Do you you have people request that they get the same mare back again? We do. We have a lot of requests. Um, It's kind of funny. There are certain, um, I call them ladies, there are certain ladies in the herd that are like, can we have her back? Can we have her back? Um, Some of our clients love our mares enough that they actually purchase them. When they're done foaling with them, they're like, man, I love this mare so much. We're just going to keep her. Sometimes they keep her as a recipient mare. Sometimes they keep them as lawn ornaments. Sometimes they keep them because they want to ride them. Um, I love that. I love the fact that people love our recipient mares enough that they want to keep them. It's also a little bit of a detriment to us because it's really hard to find those kind of mares that, you know, will get pregnant, that do such a wonderful job that people love. You know, we want to keep those, but I also understand the client's desire to keep them. Yeah. yeah, no, that's a testament that you're doing a good job when yeah. people want to keep the marriage. Yeah. yeah, I know, but as you say, it makes it difficult because we started off the talk by saying how difficult it was to create yeah. these mares. It's very difficult to find these mares. Um, it's it's a, a very select criteria, and we're so selective about it that it's not just any mare that passes muster. You know, I, I, I understand that a, a 14-year-old mare can probably still carry a full to term with absolutely no problem, but it does give you a little bit concern if she hasn't carried a full consistently. Mm-hmm. She's new to the herd. We don't know her temperament. You know, those kind of things are hard when you're managing a large number. 
again, if she's 14 and I'm introducing her into the herd, she's new to this group of mares, where is she going to fall in the pecking order? Is she going to be a top mare where she doesn't have a problem maintaining weight? Or is she going to be towards the bottom and we have to kind of baby her along? You know, those things are hard to manage on a large scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's the oldest mare you fold out in your practice? 26. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I had one when I was at UFC. This mare, she had a foal at 21. It was this guy's last race mare, so he bred her again. And um, she was 28 and pregnant in the clinic, and everybody was all panicked about it. She lay down, she popped that foal out in about 10 minutes, stood up, and they all went home the next day. So yeah. some of them just can do the job, yes. and some of them seem to have problems. So you've got this mare, she's come in, she's gone through the quarantine period, mm -hmm. she's been cleared, she's gone into the herd. What management has to be done on these horses once they actually enter the herd generally? Generally. So depending on the time of year, um, you know, we do, if let's say that she came into the herd, um, let's say she came in in the late in the fall, we don't really have a lot of embryos to transfer. So she's kind of maintaining her time until we cycle back around to the spring. So these mares get put under lights right after Thanksgiving and they, um, they're put under lights for about, I think it's about six hours. I think the lights go on at about five and they turn off at 11. So we um, try to manipulate them back into season quicker. Um, at about mid-January, we start checking the herd, trying to see who is starting to cycle again. Then we, um, if they are cycling, we follow them through a cycle and then kind of roll on and keep checking them as needed. If they're not, they get checked weekly until they are start cycling, until they do start cycling. And then we follow them through their cycles as they go. At our herd, um, we have about 150, I think it's 150 under lights. So we have a lot of mares that are hopefully will be cycling earlier in the season for these clients that need recipients in February, March. So, we, so what does that look like? 150 mares under lights. How do you accomplish that? For us to put these mares under lights, we have large catch pens where we will feed the mares. They come in at night, um, they get fed, and then there's... Um, kind of like stadium poles mm -hmm. with a large section of lights on them on a, at each corner. So no matter where these mares are at in this catch pen, they're, they're under lights. And um, it's bright enough that truly you can see it from the interstate where we're at. Mm -hmm. So sometimes if you're driving by, you're thinking, what company <laughs> is there? But it's, it's us. And, you know, they just need to be able to be under lights bright enough to be able to read a newspaper. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be crazy bright. It just needs to be bright enough. And that's how we get those mares under lights. So the lights are on a timer. They come in at a certain time, they get fed, they hang out there until about 11 o'clock at night, then they go back out. Yeah, that's the Southern Hemisphere approach. Yeah, you, yeah, know, you don't have mares in, in the stalls with the lights on, you have them outside with, with the light. So it's, it's sort of a very extensive way to run it. And essentially, though, you're managing these mares like any thoroughbred mare on a farm around here. Yes. You're doing the same thing, you're just doing it a little bit differently, right? You're putting them under lights, you're making sure they're healthy, following their cycle to make sure that they're ready. So people need to realize that these ma mares are managed to the standard that thoroughbred mares are managed on um, commercial farms right. in this town. Yep, yep. It doesn't look exactly the same, no. but it is. It, but putting them under those lights works just as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sort of makes makes a difference. So um, you're running through, you're screening these mares, you know where they are in their cycle. How do you sort of choose to say, okay, Daisy, today is your day to get an embryo? How is that done? So we hear from our clients, <clears throat> excuse me, when their donor mare is um, in heat, it is part of our protocol that they have to let us know, like, hey, Daisy got an ovulation inducing agent today. She's being bred to X stallion. We expect her to ovulate in two days. So that gives us a heads up that um, Daisy is going to be needing a recipient mare here in the very near future. It lets us have an idea of who we should be watching. We try very hard to match up donor mare size with recipient size as much as we can. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking to see, okay, if Daisy is a, a large warm blood, do I have any larger mares available for her? Um, then they, they're supposed to call us when they breed the mare. Sometimes they don't, and that's okay. We kind of have an idea. If you've given an ovulation-inducing agent, you're usually breeding the mare the next day, but they're supposed to call us or text us when they ovulate. Once they've ovulated, we will give our recipient mare an ovulation-inducing ovulation, ovulation -inducing agent at that point because you can use a recipient mare the same day as the donor has ovulated up to three days after the donor mare has ovulated. So there's a good window there where you can kind of pick and choose like, okay, this mare is ovulated two days after the donor mare. She'd be really great for this recipient for this donor or, well, this mare only ovulated one day, but she's the right size, you know, things like that kind of a little, you can manipulate a little bit, but it's really knowing the timing of when they're breeding their mare. Cause it's very important for that to be synchronized as closely as possible. 
It also depends on whether they're doing a day eight flush or a day seven flush on which uterus we pick. It's a lot of um, manipulating our uteruses to be used at the appropriate time. We really want to use the best uterus on the day of the embryo flush. So it might be that Daisy's a big warm blood mare, but I have a medium sized quarter horse mare, but she's the best uterus that day. That's the uterus we're going to pick. We want to give your embryo the absolute best chance it can to make it. Yeah. So that really emphasizes for anybody listening, if you're going down this path, communicate. Absolutely. Make sure that you are available when this is happening because you're spending a whole lot of money to generate this embryo. Yeah. You want to make sure that you give you guys the opportunity to have, as I say, that best possible uterus scenario for that embryo to go into. So, okay, we're talking about the uterus, we're talking about the mare. Yeah, maternal behavior, right? We touched on that before. Any particular breeds that um, are, are better at um, that, or is it just, is it an individual thing? Our herd consists of almost any breed you could think of. We've got quarter horses, paints, standard breads, uh, Tennessee walking horses, warm bloods, saddle breads. I'm, I feel like I'm a thoroughbreds. I'm, I feel like I'm missing things, but we have j- a little bit of everything. Myself, I'm a little picky. I love a walking horse mare. They're just so calm and so reliable and just steady 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 but um it really has not shown to matter what breed they are i mean it's kind of like people as well you're either a good mom or you're not Mm -hmm. and um the mares the mares that are newer sometimes will be a little more hesitant just like any other situation like what's happened here is this Mm -hmm. my baby what do i do with it but for the most part there really hasn't been a breed distinction that's like oh these are the best moms out there. Mm-hmm. It's it's really, it's really been fine. Yeah, yeah. Because sometimes people have preferences. Like yeah. some people, you know, um, they don't want some of the heavier breeds because you know they think, well, they're a little bit tough on my fences or something. But that's probably true. Yeah, that's probably yeah. true. The larger mares, but that. You can't really help that. That that doesn't have a lot to do with what they are as oh, a yeah. mom. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, and that's face. That was the best uterus available absolutely. on that day. The and embryo a little harder on stalls too. Just the <laughs> yeah amount of straw and that's true too. And, but and the, if you could figure out how to put an equine embryo in a Jersey cow, that would be ideal. <laughs> Pity. That's a pity laugh. Like yeah, it. I was going to say, but yeah, yeah, that was a good try. But um, yeah, okay. So, um, what's the future? Do you feel for um, reproductive management when it comes to embryo transfer? We have seen a large uptick in oocyte aspiration or ovum pickup, and freezing embryos and then transferring them at the appropriate time, and that has put a real big strain on recipient herds. Um, this year, the number of frozen embryos that want to get transferred is significantly higher than we have seen in the past. And I see that to continue. Like I see that maintaining that trend. And I think that's because you can kind of manipulate things a little bit more in your favor. So if you've frozen a bunch of embryos and you want to have March babies, you know all I have to do is have some recipients set up in April mm-hmm. and transfer away instead of waiting for your marital cycle and make sure that she looks good and do all of these things. So I see that continuing on, but I also can see that continuing to be a strain on recipient herds as like our program filled up in December of this year. It was filled to the max. And we saw similar things the year before, but before that it really wasn't. You know, we kind of still had some availability in like February, March. And it's just, it's been such a, a grab of, I've got to have these mares. I've got to have these mares. It's also one of those things like clients are starting to use their own recipient mares, like mm-hmm. their own mares at home that are just not, don't have a job. Um, and that's also a good deal. Like it's, it's nice for them to be able to have a job and do things, but it's also not something that just, oh, I've got 18 year old Sally out here and she hasn't carried a foal for a couple of years. I can throw something in her. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's a little more intensive than that. And it's, it's really, it's really boomed. I mean, it's just really blown up really large in the last couple of years. I just, I see it. I don't see an end in sight. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and to get those, those two mares to synchronize and be on the, yeah. on, on the same page. Of course, if you've got the frozen embryos. Frozen embryos is a lot easier. Lot yeah, yeah. Yeah. But if they're providing their own recipient, you have less control. 
That's because true. everything you've said so far at this point is that you know everybody has to be a little bit obsessive about the quality of that mare that you're putting the embryo in. If someone provides a recipient, well, any uterus is better than none as long as it's healthy, yes. right? And so you have less con- less control, but at least you have the opportunity to implant you know put that embryo in is is there is it opening up so people are breeding more in the in the fall time of the year is it mostly everybody wants the early foals or their 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 breed differences where they're willing to to have a pregnant mare that's going to fall later in the summer we see a lot more quarter horses in the beginning of the spring um you know february march april and then they kind of taper off warm bloods are generally year-round saddle breads are year-round uh standard breads are you know the same breeding season as thoroughbreds so we see that Walking horses, I believe, have two breeding seasons. They have like a spring and a fall. So we actually do every once in a while get some uh, walking horse people that are like, hey, we've got a mare that we want to breed in November, which everyone around here is like, ah, November, what are you talking about? But mm-hmm. it's normal for them. So um, I don't see a lot of that with the other breeds. So just because of the January 1st birthday. Yeah. And speaking of um, <clears throat> people having their own recipients and, and the control and that, it 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 does seem like it's so like it does seem easy that you know i've got a mare i can i can use her right yes it seems easy but it is all of these little details that go into it that some people either don't know about or don't think of that did she cycle at the pro- at the appropriate time is she lined up with my donor mare does she look right is she cultured clean all of these things you know that again it seems easy when we've got a, a herd of 200 and some to, to pick through. They're like, oh, well, they've got mares available. I can do this. So it's it's a numbers game as well that people don't think about. Yeah, yeah. No, you might have seven, eight mares ovulate the same day and yeah. to, to pick from. To where. pick from. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing is the aged, the aged maiden mare, right? People sort of think, oh, yeah, she's got this pristine uterus, but we'll know she may not. Yeah. And I think that's a real reality check for a lot right. of people is to sort of say, it's been sitting there cycling away for 18 years with nothing in there. And that, you know, that, that can actually lead to problems. And I think that's probably something a lot of people have trouble getting their mind around. Mm-hmm. Well, these mares sound like they're really busy when they're in the herd. At some point, though, it's going to get to the say, hey, you know, she's not a suitable candidate for an embryo. What do we do with the mares when that happens? We work very, very hard to find them happy homes. So a lot of our mares, um, they're rideable. So they go off and they, they, they become riding horses somewhere. We've got some mares that are out doing jumping careers now, which I think is really cool. We have, um, we have mares that we turn into over-optimized tease mares. Like if we love them, and I will selfishly say that I love a lot of the mares, but if I really, really love them and I want to keep them, we will over them and make them tease mares. So they, um, they do a job mm-hmm. year round and um, <laughs> I kind of keep the best ones for myself, don't let everybody know that <laughs> yeah we um we but we we do sometimes employees are like i love this one so much is there any way i can take her home for the right home absolutely we work very hard for them to find jobs after this so continuing their careers in another path yeah and i think that's really important for people to know that you know they're not disposable no and um, you know this is a partnership through this horse's life it says hey i will grow these embryos up into foals and you find me a home at the end of it and i think that's important that people realize that um again there's there's a commitment to the whole life cycle of this horse absolutely now there, there are two horses in the middle of iowa one named bart and one named pete that are plasma donors i don't know maybe maybe there could be if you have a handsome teaser out there that you can name Bart or something. And <laughs> Pete, Pete could go either way. He that's could, true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, Bart's a gelding, though. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Bart. <laughs> I, I, I hope not. Yeah. There's, there's five kids running around. Yeah, me. well, well. Call me dad. Yeah, call your dad. So that's great. Crystal, thank you for your time. That's been a fascinating walk through the recipient herd. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a, it's a neat it's a neat place, and it's, it's a lot of work. And thank you for everything you do, keeping – everything everybody all the horses organized and it, it's really important that to, to us that they're very well taken care of and that's part yes. of why we have the herd is is to control that and um you're you're a huge part of that thank you thank you yeah when they go out they got our brand on it and as bart says that you're integral in making sure that the best possible that they can be we do our best so that was stall side for this week we've been talking to crystal howard who manages the recipient herd at the rudin riddle equine reproduction facility see you next time <laughs>